I don't have bad days, man. The toughest I, thing I you'll realize is that you might not be there to protect her from you, monsters. Ariana Grande's new look has been battered by a piece of comments about how she's aging. Public enthusiasm for Brexit has waned. And now, a growing faction of the population. One person I don't need you. One person I've had this I don't need you. More since I've been alive. Right. You're too strict. Actually, you're scared. You're too strict. You're too strict. What's going on? I'm going to have to say this. Gratitude. And Christian. Now, I'm going to have to say this. Wait. Energy. Then I'll be in my life. Even in their 20s. Even more people. It is a crisis of confidence. Empowers in a messed up world. I feel like I'm very concerned about how desensitized we are as a generation. You know, what is actually happening in this world? Like if I scroll on Instagram, I will easily see somebody passing away or like, and these are brutal deaths as well. Like there is no real concern or empathy for what's actually happening in this world. We're so easy to just like it and scroll by. Oh, it's just so sad to me. So I feel like we're very desensitized to what's actually happening around us. And um, everybody has their own definition of what's good and what's bad, what's good and what's evil. And I think that really leaves a lot of people in confused places. Hello, great to be speaking to you today. If you've just joined us, you have joined us at the beginning of a brand new series of messages through this term that we've entitled Crisis of Confidence, a guide to living an empowered life. So hello to you if you're watching this at the Shoreham Center, at Oasis or at the Villas at Clarence Center or indeed watching this online. My name's Matt. I'm one of the elders here and oversee what we're doing with our content and our preaching. And this week really introduces this whole series and we've entitled it Empowered in a Messed Up World. Let me start with this. I wonder if you have a morning routine. Do you do the same things when you get up in the morning? Invariably, I'm the first one up in our household and as a pastor, what I'm supposed to say is I get up and I pray and I read my Bible, which, which I do, that's true. But actually what comes before that, if I'm honest, is making a cup of tea. <laughs> and as I'm waiting for the kettle to boil, often I will open my phone and look at the news app. And so often that's something that I regret because immediately I'm bombarded with the trouble of the world, the wars that are happening in the Middle East, in Europe, and the horrendous crimes that are committed by individuals. Tragedy on a personal and a global scale. Now, I don't know if that's something that you do in the morning or whether you look at the news that much, but as a society, what's going on in the world cer certainly is weighing on people's minds. There was a recent survey done by an organization called Young Minds, and they said this, that 82%, 82% of young people worry about big political issues such as war and conflict. 87% of young people worry about climate change. And that made me think, wow, the scale of that is incredible. Do older people worry less? Or is it just that they're already consumed with a whole other list of things to worry about, whether it's their finances, their job, caring for relatives, kids, grandkids, retirement, health, and there's just no capacity left to worry about everything else that's going on in the world. And it's true that technology certainly hasn't helped, that we get the chaos of a whole world zapped right into the palm of our hand. And it leads to a climate of uncertainty and that we can become unsure about what's going to happen in the future, our finances, ourselves, and social media, as the sort of introduction video referred to, is just like a cacophony of voices offering advice, perspectives, and that is just a, adds to the whole confusing mix. And the result in us so often can be a crisis of confidence. Where do we go with that? Well, today you've come here and I hope that what I have to say in the next half an hour is going to be helpful to that end. 
And what I wanted to bring to you today, I'm actually gone to an obscure book in the Old Testament of the Bible that's named after a rather obscure character called Habakkuk. And don't worry, even I have to look up in the contents page of my Bible to find where Habakkuk is. And we're going to hear a passage from it in just a moment. Now, I haven't got time to give you the whole context of what's going on, but Habakkuk is a man who looks upon the world around him and sees that it's in a mess. And what he does, his, the book of Habakkuk is him sort of expressing his thoughts and feelings. And where he begins in chapter one is complaining to God. Oh, Lord, Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Destruction and violence are before me. Justice never goes forth. He's in a state of anger and complaining and anxiety. But somehow something happens to him from where he writes in chapter one to chapter three and he undergoes something of a transformation. Somehow he becomes empowered. Let's listen to where he lands in chapter three. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. The reason I chose this passage from Habakkuk is because the circumstances that he faces do not change from chapter one to chapter three that we've just heard. In verse 17 there, he's talking about how bad things continue to be. Really, he's talking about famine. He's facing a severe situation. And it's a reminder to us that sometimes things in life are bad and continue to be bad and there's nothing that we can really do about it. Maybe that's the situation that you're facing in your life right now. You're stuck in circumstances. I mean, maybe you're stuck because of ill health or you're, you're stuck in terms of looking after a family member or you're stuck financially or in a career or stuck with colleagues or it can be anything. What do you do then? Well, Habakkuk, as I've mentioned, seems to have learned something. He's actually undergone something of a transformation, but it's not because things have got better outside of him. No, he's learned something in God that he's landed in a place of joy and peace and strength. Don't you want some of that? I mean, surely this is the, the secret of life. life. I mean, anyone can be joyous when the circumstances that they face are joyous, but how do you maintain joy and peace and strength and empowerment when your circumstances are bad? Because ine inevitably all of us will face that. If we can get there, Wow, what a difference that will make in our lives to be empowered despite the circumstance that we face. Well, the first thing I want to point out to you from this is to notice that this is a song. You'll see in your Bible at the end, it mentions about to the choir master and that sort of thing. Now, admittedly, this is quite a weird song, <laughs> especially the first bit. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines. It, it's a song about how badly things are going. And that's not actually, even in the society we live today, is not a song that we often hear, which surprises me a little bit. Because I really think there is a place for this in British society. And I, I, I struggle to understand why there's not more songs just about how bad things are going. Because in the workplaces around the country, that really is what people love to talk about so often. In my working life, I have worked in lawyers' offices and catering in the public sector and sales businesses. And in each one, 
talking about and complaining about how badly things are going is, is what people do so often. That, in many ways, sums up the national mood. And so um, why, when uh, you know, so many workplaces got the radio on in the background, whatever radio station that might be, I think if there were songs that spoke into that, people would relate to that. That would be popular. Things are going terribly. Everyone's in a flap. Sales are down. We can't get new staff. And the outlook's pretty rubbish. I mean, I think people would get on board with that sort of song. I don't understand why there's not more songs like that. Because the British appraisal of life, the sort of how we appraise what's going on, it's on a scale that starts at well, terrible. How's it going? Bad. And then even as we go into the positive, it's, well, it's not terrible. And above that is, oh, it's not bad. <laughs> even the positives are negative. Now, we might not hear songs like that on the radio. Maybe there's a niche in the market there, I think. But there are songs that we hear in our heads. Now, I don't know if you are someone who has music going on in your head most of the time. I realized a few years ago that other people didn't have this, which is quite a surprise to me because I'm someone, often there's a little jingle or some song from years and years ago or some song that I've heard in a shop or something. It just gets stuck in my head. And invariably what that happens is that I start singing along to that song. And this is something that really annoys my children. And the dad, dad, stop singing, stop singing. And I say to them, well, in my defense, the song's already playing in my head. I, I'm just joining in. What happens inside comes out. Now, whether or not, where am I going with this? Whether or not you are someone who literally has music playing in your head. What I want to say today is that there are songs in your head as you interpret the world around you. That there's lyrics, that there's ideas and thoughts that perpetuate and go around in your head, in your heart, as you interpret the world. You see, this is, when we're asking the question, why is it that stuff that we see on our phones or the stuff that happens to us affect us? Well, it's because we internalize it. We make sense of the world and we tell ourselves stories, and I'm going to say sing ourselves songs in our hearts and minds. Because you might say, well, look, the wars that we see and we, we, the climate crisis or disasters or economic downturn or pandemics, they have the power somehow to cause us anxiety and uncertainty and a lack of confidence, even though they're miles away from us. Why are they affecting us so much? Well, it's because there's something in us that takes that information and we tell ourselves something. It's like we sing ourselves a song in our heads and it's probably going on subconsciously. The world's a scary place and something suf suffering will come to you. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of singing in this message. Our brain is detecting danger and that triggers a fear response in us that something bad is going to happen. That's what we're singing to ourselves. Now, this is in some respect a natural reaction. Our body is trying to keep us safe and it's normal for those thoughts and emotions to come up when we see things like that. But the problem is that in the world that we lived in, live in now, where all this information is coming at us all the time through technology, the triggers are nonstop. And we're constantly bombarded with sources of danger that we interpret as reasons to be fearful and anxious and on edge and they overwhelm us. Add that to all the day-to-day -day things that we can perceive as danger and difficulty and unsettle us and we can feel overwhelmed. And that's why as a society, that is what we are facing. That we interpret the signals from outside. And we're overwhelmed and overloaded by it. And this is what is happening. See, this is what's happening with Habakkuk in chapter one. His, his song, and the whole thing is kind of like a song. His song is loads of bad stuff's happening and God doesn't care and he's to blame. That's how he interprets what's going on. And that's the song that he sings to himself and then he sings it out loud. 
That's the, the song that he is living in at the beginning of his journey. Have you ever sung that? Loads of bad stuff's happening. God doesn't care and he's to blame. Maybe not consciously, maybe consciously, but it's a thought, a lyric that we cultivate inside of us, if we're honest. How about this one? God doesn't care about my situation. He's forgotten all about me. Is that a song that plays inside of you sometimes? Sound familiar to you? You see, it's what we do. We make sense of the outside world and we jump to conclusions. And what happens is that our thoughts and feelings go in this negative cycle. It happens, it happens all the time. It happens to you, it happens to me. You know, say, say you're at work and someone criticizes you. Let's call him Colin. And what happens, you feel, you find that hard, you feel hurt. And then inside of you, you make up a little song that interprets what's just happened. Colin is mean, he never liked me. I am her and deserve sympathy. Now, the question is, is that true? It doesn't actually matter. I mean, maybe Colin was right to criticize you. Maybe you have done stuff that's not right. Maybe, Colin, maybe Colin's trying to help you. Or maybe it's nothing about you at all. Colin, he's just having a bad day and he's just lashing out. Here's the important, listen to this, here's the important thing. It's not actually the objective truth of the situation that actually affects your life experience. What actually affects you, your thoughts, your feelings, your outlook on life that will lead to your decisions, your behavior, the way you think about life is how you interpret that situation. What you tell yourself, what is the song that's in your heart, what you're singing to yourself, the songs in your heads. And when those songs are negative time and time again, what happens is our lives are filled with fear and not faith, anxiety and not empowerment, timidity and not confidence. So that leads us to the question, how do we change the tune? Because I want to be, be a person of, of faith and strength and empowerment and confidence, whatever's going on around me, don't you? And somehow Habakkuk, he's discovered this secret. He's moved from this negative song to this positive song. Yet yeah, I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deers. He makes my feet tread on the high places. Suddenly his, his song has gone from one of anger and bitterness and confusion and complaining to joy and strength and stability. That's the deer bit in there, just so you know. How does he, how does he get there? How does he go from this negative to this positive? Do you want, you, you want to know that? I want to know that. Well, I think I found the answer. I'm, I'm not sure you're going to like it, but here it is. What's he doing? He's singing. And really, that's what I've got to tell you today. Friends, you've got to sing yourself to strength. Really? <laughs> See, I said you might not like it. If the songs in our head or heart inside of us are an overreaction to the circumstances that we're facing, causing us worry and fear and a negative outlook on life, then you've got to change the tune. And the thing is, you can't just stop those songs because your brain and your emotion is reacting for a reason. What you've got to do is you've got to drown out that song with a different song until all that you can hear is the new song and you'll start to live and act and think and be according to the truth of that new song. 
And that's what Habakkuk is doing here. He says, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. And I believe God wants to speak to us today about his song, his gospel song that he wants us to hear. And he doesn't want just us to hear it, but to believe it and live it and sing it and be it. You see, the whole message of the Bible, the whole message of Christianity is like a song. Before the whole world was created, there was a Father, Son and Holy Spirit, God Himself. And what were the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit doing in triune community in eternity past, loving one another, rejoicing in one another like an eternal song, a flowing of love and goodness and faithfulness and kindness. That is who God is. And then out of the overflow of that song of love, God created a world so that others, created beings, could enjoy this love song of God. And yet what happened? The Bible tells us that as the world was made, the world stopped singing that song, found new lyrics for itself. And that's the story of humanity rejected God, rejected his song. Hey, we can come up with our own songs. We don't need God to govern over us. We want to be our own gods. And we started singing a new song. But God in his love sent the Savior Jesus Christ to step down into our world to teach us this love song again and to be that love. And Jesus came into this world full of love and acceptance and forgiveness and restoration. And Jesus even went to the cross to die for the sins of the world and rose again to new life so that all of humanity could come in and know the love of the Father. And that He sent His Spirit upon all who believe in Christ so that song of love could be in our hearts and not just be something that we hear, but something that we know. Have you ever wondered why like 90% plus of the songs in this world are love songs? Because they are a reflection of the great love song of God, that God is a song of love that He sings to His creation. The gospel of Jesus is a song of love, a Saviour loving His bride, the church, a celebration, it's music, it's song. And I believe Jesus wants to hear the song of love that he has for you today. To hear it afresh, to hear it anew, to hear his voice. And when you do his song to drown out all the other songs. And if you do, you will be changed. You see, within us are competing songs that are the soundtrack to our lives. And the question is, what are we going to tune into? What's going to shape you? The songs of fear or the songs of faith? Now, I want to help us access this. So let me ask you a question. With this in mind, what voice within us is the most important The voice of others, what other people say of us. The voice of you, what you tell yourself. Or the voice of God, the wonderful truth about Jesus Christ. Which is most important when it comes to living an empowered life? Which is it? The voice of others, the voice of you, or the voice of God? You're probably saying right now, the voice of God. And you know what? I used to think so. I'm going to say something. I've changed my mind and go with me here. Okay, let me say something subtle and see if you can get the nuance of this. And maybe afterwards, if you still think so, you can call me a heretic and send that in by email. You see, 
in our lives, we have the voices of others and they say stuff to us all the time. Maybe not literally, maybe through circumstance. This is how we interpret in the song that comes in our life. You're not good enough. You can't do this. You're not worthy of love. You're rejected. You're unlovely. The voice of others can have a powerful effect on us and that can be a song that we live in. We can live according to that tune. And you know what? That's a one-way ticket to depression and despair. If you live according to those lyrics. On the other hand, there is the voice of God. This gospel of Jesus Christ that I'm talking about. And he comes into this world and he sings this song and says, no, through faith in me, you are loved. You are chosen. You are accepted. You are forgiven. You are mine. You are brought into loving relationship with me. And I love you forever and you belong to me and I will provide for you. That's the truth of this gospel song. But I tentatively say to you that that is not necessarily most important here in the sense that because so many of you understand that song, you know the lyrics to that song and that truth is not the problem here Yet you live still fearfully trouble and struggle. That's your lived experience. So how does that happen? Well, God's word is powerful, but it's very possible to know the lyrics of the gospel, but not sing the song. You hear it when I speak, but within you, in your heart, there's a different song that's playing, a song that perpetuates and justifies your insecurity and your anxieties. And you think and you feel and you live according to that song and not the song of Jesus. And so what I'm saying here is actually the voice of you will shape you most of all. What you tell yourself, what you sing to yourself about life, your situation, other people and God is what will shape you. That's why it's the most important. And what I'm saying here is that faith, faith in Jesus Christ is where we actively start singing along to the Jesus song in our hearts. We tune into and we live and we believe in Him and we appropriate that. That's what faith is to trust Him and to sing His song of truth and love and goodness in our lives. You see, Jesus in His earthly ministry, He was surrounded by people who knew the lyrics to God's song, but they didn't live the life because in their hearts was a totally different song, songs of selfishness and bitterness. And they thought they were blessed, but Jesus went around and He was forever contradicting them and pointing out their mistakes. What did Jesus say? Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And you say, what? Well, the Pharisees, well, they loved obedience. They did everything, everything right on the outside. Their obedience was external. But what Jesus is talking about, what the Apostle Paul later describes in the New Testament as the true obedience is obedience from the heart. What shapes you is what you believe in here. What song is playing at the deepest part of who you are? Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's what I'm talking about. That the gospel of Jesus, the song that he sings of his love for you is not just something that we understand at an intellectual level, that we take captive in our hearts to make it obedient to Christ. Friends, you've got to slow down in your life and ask yourself the question, what song is playing in your heart? Is it a song of 
fear and anxiety? Is it true? And is it or is it a song of God's love for you? Is that what you're living in? What you're living according to? Because look, anxiety, fear, uncertainty, they're part of life. And, and as I say, your body is just trying to keep you safe. And they make for a good warning system, but they make for a terrible soundtrack. Friends, Jesus has been singing his gospel song of his love for you. And you've been tuned into a different station in your heart. I want to encourage you to do today. Well, you've got to to repent. You have to reject those destructive songs, those destructive narratives that fuel anxiety in your heart. And you have to embrace the gospel song, the Jesus song. How do you do that? You have to, you believe it in your heart and you sing it, literally sing it. Because as we outwardly sing and declare, that cultivates an inward dependence on Jesus. As we choose to sing of Jesus' love for you and what he's done and who you are in him. As we sing that, we cultivate that in faith in our heart. I've got to, I've got to do this every day, even today, even this morning. I recognize in my heart that there's insecurities and vulnerabilities and thoughts and feelings that are causing me to feel unsettled. And I've got to teach my heart. Now the gospel says something different. This is not true. God's love for me is true in Christ. I am secure in him. And I, need, I literally need to sing those things out loud to help me stand in this truth that's already true. And we've got to help one another in this. We've got to help diagnose it as we speak to one another about what's going on lovingly. Can we say to one another, hey, it sounds like you're singing a song of self-pity or of anger or of jealousy and anxiety. And that's, is that what the song of Jesus goes like? He's got something better for you. His song is better for you. You're not a victim, you're loved. Don't be angry. You've got to trust him to vindicate. Don't be jealous. Trust his provision. Don't be anxious. Life is in his hands. And the most one, you know what the most wonderful thing about the song of Jesus? It's true. All that he's done for you, it's true. And as we sing it, as we believe it, as we live it, The Holy Spirit writes those truths afresh in our hearts and our anxieties and our fears are put down into the right place and we stand empowered in Him. If we're going to live an empowered life like Habakkuk, we've got to sing the song of salvation like he did. Actually singing it will change the song of your heart. You teach your heart as you sing. So that's, that's my prescription for you today. Sing the wonderful song of Jesus' salvation at least once a day. Sing it in the car. <laughs> sing it in a park. Sing it in your home. Sing it at work <laughs> if you can. In the morning, in the evening, sing it to yourself. God's goodness, now he's loving. And allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen you in that. You see, it takes faith to see. You've got you to look to Christ, remind yourself what he's done. But it drowns out those bad negative songs that will rob you of joy. You know, when I was a young man, I used to sing a different song. And the song I sang went like this. I know best. I know what I like. I can only trust myself and I am great. That's the song that I was singing in my heart. And that's how I lived for a period of my life. But it got me into all sorts of problems. And for a start, it wasn't true. (laughs) And you know, then I met Jesus. 
And I realized that his song to me was quite different. And it went like this. He says, you're not that great, but you're special to me. You don't know best, but I have plans for your life. The world's a scary place and you don't have what it takes, but you can trust me and I won't let you down. Now, I'll be honest, I should live in that song every day, but I don't all the time. Sometimes the first song creeps back in. But I know that I'm at my best when I sing Jesus' song and join in with him, when that song of his love for me shapes my life. And I know I need to sing and revel in his love. And so I sing and I sing out loud. And then my kids get annoyed. <laughs> and I tell them in my defense, the song's already playing in my heart. I'm just joining in. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Amen.